Dr Andy DL, welcome. How are we? <laughs> very well, thank you. Very well. Thank you for the welcome. Nice to be here. No, good. Um, ever since I've started doing these podcasts, I've been really keen to get you on. I've, that's why I've been pestering you um, <laughs> um, on LinkedIn. The reason for that, I believe the work that you're doing is very important. Um, and any parent of any child, um, I would recommend and urge them to listen to what you've got to say because the impact it can have on child's development is absolutely massive. Um, so you specialise in, um, I would need to read this, bilateral integration in neurodevelopment, um, as well as being involved in a number of different research programmes, which I'm sure we'll come on to talk about as we go through the podcast itself. Um, but over the years, you've developed your own programme called Better Movers, Better Thinkers. And these are the programmes designed as interventions for people who have behaviour or learning difficulties, um, developmental delays, or just generally underachieving in an aspect of their life. Have I summed that up? You summed up better than I probably would. Excellent. <laughs> um, it's been adopted into Scottish schools. It's getting real traction internationally. So can you just very simply explain to us what it is and the methodology behind it? So Better Movers and Thinkers was originally an approach to delivering high-quality physical education in schools. In essence, physical education in Scotland was delivering a high quality of experience to the kids, but we knew there was more available based on the research that we've been doing, as well as 20 odd years of clinical practice, working with those with additional support needs of a variety of different kinds. So a guy called Thomas Downs, a guy called John French and myself were the kind of three legs of the stool that started to piece together this idea of, well, we're just making kids move and we're just making kids think in class why are we not bringing both threads together? Because the research shows that actually, if I'm physically capable and cognitively capable, I have more chance in my life of being something called self-regulated. So I can attend, I can concentrate, I can listen, I can remember things. Um, so Better Movers and Thinkers was really our attempt to try and bring all the good stuff from research together collectively. And so we did that, run some pilot projects in a few schools through North Lanarkshire. Um, the anecdotal feedback was extremely positive, both from the pupils in the school as well as the teachers in particular. Things like better on-task behaviour in classrooms, less behavioural troubles and things like this, and just general more engagement from all of the kids, regardless of circumstances. So then I took it forward to uh, do a PhD uh, in an academic rigorous study. The evidence was very positive and extremely strong, uh, very, very positive. And we rolled it out through Education Scotland over a four year cycle where Thomas was seconded from his role as well as John French uh, to kind of be the developmental officers of that approach. And I was kind of bailed in as a consultant for Education Scotland during those four years. And then it just grew arms and legs. We ended up doing things like summer schools for teachers where we thought teachers, to be fair, very hard job, very hard working. And they've got six weeks in the summer, which is precious. And we thought if we run a summer school, teachers are not going to give up those holidays. And we were amazed by the people that got involved. So the following year, we ran another summer school, one at an introductory level, one at an intermediate level. And again, we're talking over 250 teachers attending, which is a lot for a summer holiday. Um, it just shows you that most teachers just want to do the best they can for their kids, isn't it? And they're I willing think, to go any length. I would agree. I mean, I think... Teachers get a bad press most of the time. And in actual fact, they're doing a very tough job under very limited situations. Most teachers, I would, if I were to pick a number, 95% of teachers still do it because of the vocational love of helping kids move on in their life. You're always going to get bad apples in any profession. That's just the way that life is, really, in terms of human nature. But a lot of these teachers, they want to be involved because they want to know how to be a better teacher to make the learners better learners. It's just that some of them, I guess don't necessarily have an open enough mind to really embrace all that could be done because every kid's different and every kid needs a different slant, a different approach, a different personality to really get the most out of their learning. And I think that's what BMT has really done is it's offered another toolbox or another tool in a teacher's toolbox to really draw on. And the thing that's really great about it is it's evidence based. It's not a, this seems like a good idea. It's one that's been tried and tested. So, so, um, how does it differ? So break it down. So how does it differ from, so you've got your classroom activities where a child sat behind a desk and taught. Then you've got PE. Uh, it's a long time since I've been at school, but you would <laughs> you would batter a, a bean bag about a hall or something like that or uh, run about and jump off a bench. So how 
give me a practical example of how you've combined the two and what would a child do? Okay, so I guess the best thing to do is to take you through what's called the BMT process. So imagine you're in a class in a gym hall with 25 to 35 kids of any age, pick an age, doesn't really matter. It's called physical education. So the clue's in the name. <laughs> you know, we're trying to enhance their physical ability to manage themselves. And certainly in things like preschool and primary school in particular, BMT's approach is trying to educate children about how to balance, how to have good muscle tone, good postural control, good gross motor and fine motor coordination. So just to move well and to move in the right way. So we might give them a very basic pattern. We might ask them to skip for four steps, jog for four steps, hop on the right foot for four steps, hop on the left foot for four. So there's a sequence all of a sudden. So now they have to memorize the sequence. So you're working on their working memory, which is the instructional memory, the here and now. And what you get from working memory transfers into short-term memory. And if you need to hold on to it for a longer period of time, it will then find its way into long-term memory. Gone are the days where you come in, you take a register, the kids run for five minutes playing TIG to warm up, then you do a couple of drill practices, play a game if the kids have behaved themselves, cool them down and send them back to class. BMT completely changes that. And I would say a lot of advances in PE over the last 20 years have also been trying to change that. So if we've got that basic pattern in, what we might then say to the kids is, okay, when I clap my hands, I want you to change direction as fast as you can. And then we shout the word change. But that wasn't the instruction. The instruction was when I clap my hands. So it's bringing that attentive element in as well as something called inhibition control. So managing impulsiveness. And it's really tapping into an, a set of tools called executive function skills, which are the highest level of cognitive abilities that we have. So what BMT does after that is just layers it up. So if the kids have done well at that physical base, and then we've had that cognitive demand and they're doing great, we increase the demand of the physical. So we might bring hand movements in with the skipping and so on. Then we increase the cognitive element. Then we increase the physical. Then And we just keep layering and then gradually progress that towards like an end performance. Mm -hmm. So that could be anything from a gymnastics, dance, rugby, volleyball, whatever context that the physical education lessons take part in. We just do that laying approach to get to that end product. I've um, I've tried some of your programs. <laughs> um, I've been a, a, a guinea pig. Um, and it sounds very simple about, well, you're going to do, um, you're going to do a certain routine in terms of what you're doing. But when you start having to split across your brain, I guess, in one side of your body and, and, and the other side of your body, that's where I really, really struggled with it. <laughs> and you think, well, surely I can remember a 12 sequence step. I'm over 40, God's sake. <laughs> then then all of a sudden it's incarnate. So it's, a, it's a amazing how that develops. So um, that's that's within your, your kind of standard academic um, setting. What impact have you seen that have on children in particular who either have behavioural issues or developmental issues? Because people don't often put um, a behavioural issue necessarily together with physical education or moving is going to sort that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a great question. I get asked it no matter where I'm traveling in the world is what impact does it actually have? And the answer is a direct one. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of different ways to get the best out of kids or, or human beings. Good eating, good sleeping, good physical activity, healthy lifestyle are all part of that. But when it comes to actually enhancing your daily performance, for me, I think the priority is a child's self-regulation. How can they manage themselves? How can they make the right decisions? How can they make a wrong decision, recognize it as an error and come up with a plan B to solve it in a different way? How can they solve any kind of problems in their life? Because that's what living and existing and surviving is all about. I think the impact therefore that BMT as an approach has is it's directly targeting these high cognitive abilities to enhance them, to make them as athletic mentally as as the individual can manage to really achieve their very best, whatever that best happens to be, because we all have our limitations. So BMT directly targets those skills and has that underlying physical system to then, if you like, put the output of it. If I want to think about a solution and then come up with it, I need to speak that solution to share it with somebody or I need to move to show somebody. But if I can't coordinate my body, but I can think really well, I've got nowhere to go. And the same is true of the reverse. If you can move brilliantly, but I can't think very well, then I'm, I'm really limited. 
So the impact that BMT has had is it's really brought that integration. It's allowed the kids to move and think collectively in a much more efficient, integrated way. The impact on the learners is significant. Academic study shows much better coordination and much better cognitive abilities for those who receive BMT when they're stacked against those who have received traditional methods in physical education. So we know the evidence is really robust and really strong. But aside from education, on a clinical level, in my clinical practice, <laughs> it's mesmerizing. It, it can be quite literally life-changing for some individuals and enhancing for others because it isn't going to be a, a ma magical miracle cure. Nobody would ever refute that that's the situation, that it doesn't have an impact, but you can't claim it to be a miracle cure either because it isn't a one-size-fits-all. There are many, many kids will benefit from BMT as an approach and bilateral integration and neurodevelopment and so on. But likewise, there are those where, no, they need something else other than that. But that's why I think it's good that we have it as an option because it's going to marry up with a lot of kids in a lot of schools and make teachers' job a little bit easier, make their teaching more efficient, more effective. And that has a direct impact on the learners, uh, whether it be socially or emotionally or academically. So if you went into a gym hall, say with 30, 40 kids and got them to do some physical activities, like a, a couple of quick tests, is a, a direct correlation between the output of that tests and their grouping a, a, academically? Could you almost, by watching the move, say these children will be traditionally at the top of the class all the way down? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's maybe not as simple as perhaps we like to make it sound, I don't suppose. But um, I think I've done it the clinical work for so many years now, it's 22 years now, and um, I've got really adept at watching people and observing just their mannerisms, their body language, the way they move, uh, the way they interact with different things to kind of get a bit of a feel for them before I've done any assessment. And that's just experience, Danny. It's, it's straightforward experience. I don't think you get that from a book per se. I get it from learning from other people, watching how they do it and then put my own stance on it. But you go into a PE hall or even go to a family wedding or anything where people are dancing or moving or something, it's not difficult to identify those who lack rhythm or lack timing. Those who have, you know, a very basic rudimentary sense of how to manage their body in space. The ones who are banging into things all the time or tripping over all the time. And these are clearly indications where the balance system is underdeveloped because balance is like your compass point inside your body. It tells you where you are. It lets you know where your body finishes and space actually begins. So you can navigate the world so much easier if that balance system's doing its job. Now, balance interacts with every other sensory system we have other than the sense of smell. So if my balance is out, the other sensory systems are either out also or have to compensate for what the balance system's not doing. And that just makes life harder and stuff like this. When you watch kids move in a gym hall, you can identify these kids pretty quickly. And then you want to back your hunch up with some standardized tests that actually are very specific to the area that you're trying to investigate, which gives you a really un deep understanding as to where the kids are at developmentally. Well, so the child, and I was one of these childs, um, <laughs> the, the child that is, everyone's saying, oh, they're clumsy, they drop stuff, they're always banging in, they're, they're dropping things. There is real activities that child can do from a young age that's going to improve that situation dramatically rather than just saying he or she's clumsy. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two ways of looking at it. There's definitely direct activities, exercises, approaches that can be done to help these kids for sure. But I think we need to break it down almost to three component parts. I think we can't rule out the impact that genetics has on our ability and you can't change genetics. It's not feasible to do so. The second component part are those with actual cognitive impairments or disabilities, where there's a pathology, there's a damage in the brain, which you can't repair. But neither should you accept that as their limitation. You should then push to get the most of what they do have available. Whatever the baseline is, you can improve that baseline. Yeah, I definitely think you mm -hmm. can. It's just what are you improving it for? Kids with real disabilities, for example, you're improving their quality of life. Kids where they don't have that disability and genetically they come from a fairly good stock. There's not a family history of any issues. It's about that stimulation exposure. And that's where the environment that you create has a direct impact on these kids to move on in life. So whether there are genetic limitations, uh, pathological limitations, or just a lack of experience, there are things that can be done in each of these three situations to enhance that child's ability to get on in their life. Yeah. One of the things I found fascinating um, was 
when we were talking about um, child reflexes and the developmental reflexes, and you could tell some children a reflex hadn't went by a time it should have and how that has a massive impact. Yeah, that's the world of neurodevelopmental therapy. Um, it was originally um, put together by a guy called Dr. Peter Blythe down in, in Chester, an organisation called INPP. And his whole process was uh, when we were first uh, conceived and the way that the body then develops for those nine months in utero, we have a whole bunch of reflexes called primitive reflexes, which allow the baby to move and develop in the womb. They then assist that child to be born naturally into the world. And then they're really designed for that child to survive the first six to 12 months of life. But in that six to 12 months, there's development that should happen that begins to either inhibit the continued activity of those reflexes or they transform to a more adult-like form of themselves. So for example, one of them is called a Palmer reflex. And if you have a brand new baby and you put something in the baby's hand, the first thing a baby will do is grab a hold. But it doesn't know that it's doing it. You know, everybody thinks, oh, the baby loves me, but <laughs> the baby's not got a clue what's going on, which is also why babies can't actually choose to let go. And you've got to really prize yourself out of that, that grasp because they're very strong, these reflexes. They're survival mechanisms. So that should really be inhibited in that first six to 12 months. If it hasn't been, then it continually stays active and that can interfere with future development moving forward. So this example means that the child's development of fine motor skills to learn to do things like brush their teeth, put their clothes on, tie their shoelaces, control a pencil or a paintbrush or a crayon, become much more limited for these kids. So if you address the underlying physical barrier, you free up and open up the access to these kids to move on in their life. And can you remove that reflex? It's not so much removing it, it's inhibiting it so that you and I both have our primitive reflexes in our central nervous system. They're just dormant. They're just not active at all because they've been superseded because of experience, good genetics, hopefully. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> good lifestyle or, or whatever. So we've got much more control over ourselves. We've got voluntary control over what we do. Those who have a, a cluster of primitive reflexes, that's involuntary control. So it'll just fire up whenever it decides it needs to rather than because you want it to. And that's the difference. So when you're testing a three or four year old, is there certain reflexes that you look for? Is there, is there a group of five telltale reflexes? I mean, there's 14 primitive reflexes that you can test once uh, a child is born uh, and stuff. There is something called a gag reflex as well, which is when babies can be born in water because they automatically know how to hold their breath. Uh, but I don't test for that. Um, uh, f there's no reason You've for me no to test pool. for that. No swimming pool uh. in the clinic. That's what it is. Yeah, no hydrotherapy. Not where I live. But certainly those 14 reflexes are a whole bunch of reflexes that can be tactile, so stimulated by touch, ones that are balance driven, and ones that are tonic neck. So wherever the position the head is in, what does the body do in response, for example. So those 14 reflexes you can test very specifically. And again, it was Peter Blythe and, and a colleague called David McLone who came up with the testing procedures for this based on past research from many, many decades ago. Um, and they've just really pieced it all together to, to what we now know as the INPP method. Wow. Um, so the Curriculum for Excellence was introduced uh, <laughs> uh, was introduced in Scotland, I think it was 2010. Um, and it was meant to be once in a generation um, change in how children are educated. Um, and it's about the whole child education concept. So it's abso absolutely fantastic. I was doing a bit of research last night and one of the core principles is health and wellbeing. <laughs> so what's your thoughts? I mean, first of all, Scotland needs to be pretty proud of itself because to my knowledge, we are the first country in the world that has health and wellbeing as a curriculum area, which I think is really is significant that, is that right? and really yeah. huge. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that health and well-being needs to be on the curriculum, probably more so post-pandemic than pre-pandemic, um, although I think there's arguments that it should be there regardless. I think health and well-being has become a really important area, but I think we tend to focus too much at the moment on mental health and not enough on all the other bits that then support health and well-being in its entirety. Um, I think it's a good thing that it's on the curriculum and it should stay there. I think it's great that physical education is at the centre of that, where I believe it should be, because I think there are a lot of health benefits you get from having kids being physically active, as well as integrating together socially and emotionally. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't like it to be withdrawn. I would just like us to be better at it. I think that we've got such an opportunity here 
to really make a massive national difference to every human being that's walking in Scotland right now. And even those who are home educated, for example, still have the ability to access free resources from the Health and Wellbeing and from Education Scotland's National Improvement Hub to know what to do for their kids. Um, as much as Joe Wicks has done a fairly decent job during the pandemic of having people physically active, he's not a physical education teacher. And there is a difference between physical activity and physical education. Um, so for me, I think that schools need to really almost increase the value that physical education and the other areas of health and well-being have within a school curriculum. It's really interesting when you look at studies that say, you know, kids who have poor writing will make them write more, but it doesn't necessarily result in, in better writing. It just makes them more frustrated with having to write, if you like. Physical education is such a key area that why we don't have PE on a school timetable every day, Monday to Friday, for every kid in the school baffles me completely. I, I don't understand it. Because all the studies, a really famous study done in Scotland, and it's called the Linwood Project by a guy called John Polacek. And he put daily physical education into one school and compared it to another school. And the kids who got daily PE, behavior was better, ac attendance was better, academic achievement was better. And it was a perfect blueprint to say, let's get PE in here every day for these kids. And again, nothing happened because I don't think it was sexy enough for politicians to win votes and to actually make a change at that time. When the pandemic came, I was like, right, we've got a great opportunity here now to actually, when we all get back to normal life, we were integrating together, let's get Daily P on the agenda again. And it, nothing transpired. Was, there's been no change in education, really, in terms of the curriculum, despite the pandemic giving us an opportunity to have some good reforms in there. And they're really easy reforms, Danny that in five, 10 years from now would save money. <laughs> so financially, it's a good idea, but just for kids to get a better chance at life, surely even if it was going to cost a little bit more, that's worth the funding, but we haven't done it. So as a society, it actually feels like we're moving backwards. So when you were coming on, I was doing a little bit of research. So five years ago, our former first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, she made a big announcement about um, halving childhood obesity in Scotland. Um, so I think that was 2018. So that was 14% of children were obese or risk of obese. Um, in 2021, that, that had actually increased to 18%. But the latest stats now show, I think they were out just last year, that 22% um, of primary one children are now obese. And of that 22%, 70% of those, of the 21% are from poorer backgrounds. So not only... Are we not doing enough? We're regressing. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to argue with those stats, that's for sure. They are legit. Um, I think the difficulty when it comes to trying to address obesity or overweight in a population, be it children, adolescents, young people, whatever, is that most societal issues such as this, people feel can get resolved within school. And yes, school has a role to do to educate kids, but not to solve so society's problems, that's not what schools are designed to do. It's a teaching and learning hub. That's its job. In order to address things like obesity, things like increasing the regular daily activity that kids do is the easiest solution. But it's not as simple as that. We have to also think about, you know, the quality of food, advertising that's on social media, YouTube stations and so on, where they're praying to the kids, you know, go and ask mum and dad for something sugary or something quick fixing or whatever. And the quality of life in general is not supporting the government's wish to reduce obesity and overweight in childhood population. Because things like a Happy Meal, for example, is, is, is cheaper than most other, let's say, better, more quality meals. The low income families who don't have a great deal of money, especially with the cost of living crisis that we're currently going through, it's much easier for them to put a Happy Meal in their kid to know that they fed their kid because they don't want to be neglective parents. So it's a much bigger problem than just making kids physically active. I think there's something called the 24 hour movement behaviors. I think it's much more about educating parents and supporting parents. How do I actually achieve those guidelines for my child? Because that's where you can address health as a lifestyle overall, not just for those who are overweight or obese, but the entire population. Um, 
But I think daily physical education would make a huge difference because for many kids, that's the only activity they get. Because when they go home, typically they'll follow suit with what mom and dad's behavioral traits are and habits are and mold into that. It sounds a really callous thing to say, but overweight kids often have overweight parents. And, and as I said earlier on, the environment has a huge influence on you. So if you're shaped by parents who sit in front of TV at nighttime after dinner and that's all they do, then that's what you think is learn normal. Behavior. Yeah, it's just learned behavior, correct. So I think there are there are lots of educational things we need to do and be better at doing to make parents better informed about making the right choices for their kids and then doing what we can to support the parents and their kids to make the right decision. And and we're not doing that nearly enough, which is why the numbers are getting bigger rather than getting smaller. There was a lot to cover in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're, if you're a family that, that perhaps is from a deprived background and you've got generational um, issues going back, how do we how do we save that child, the, the child who's three or four just now, um, their parents perhaps don't know, don't care, aren't interested. How, how as a society do we try and help? Because the only way we're going to try and fix it is from the ground up, which is the children. I'm not going to deny that. I think again, for me, it's, the, it's a funding issue more than anything else. Mm -hmm. We seem to put more funding into primary and secondary education than we do in preschool education. And yet those first five years are probably the most informative years of a child's life. So if we want to break the cycle, if we want to actually deal with it, we've got to put more funding into the preschool years. And I mean from zero through to five, through to when school begins. And that is by not just educating parents, but by supporting parents to be able to make the right decisions. Um, there are lots of great organisations out there that are trying really hard to, to, to provide opportunities for parents of low-income families as well as just families in general. Um, but there's not enough of them uh, and they're not supported enough to really do the job that we want to do to make those numbers change and go the other way. I mean, we don't even measure physical fitness in our kids in schools and yet most other European countries do. <laughs> I think, well... Why are we not doing that? To get a measure of where we're at just now, because that helps us provide a blueprint to then do exactly what you're suggesting, make a difference. But if we're not measuring where the actual problems are, then we're not putting the right things in place to make the changes that need to be made to achieve the goal that we're trying to achieve. Um, I definitely think there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done, as you say, from the, from the root up. And those first five years for me is key. So if a child was to come into school really malnourished, um, there is a there's a process that kicks in place to protect to protect that child if they come in clearly dishevelled not clean all, all of these things th there is a process where that child will be protected we hope um, <laughs> if a child comes in obese there's no process to protect that child in terms of looking at what's going on and if one of the key elements that you're saying there that there's no measurements within school of a, a child's overall fitness and health and that's going to have a massive impact when they go in. Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, the big issues is that we've gone so far the other way about body shaming and all those situations that we actually can identify the real issues that are at hand. If a kid's five years of age and obese, that child's quality of life and the length of their life is shortened dramatically. And if we're talking about human rights and in particular children's rights, then we've got to help that kid realise that they're unhealthy we can't say, well, we can't say he's overweight because it might hurt his feelings. We can't say he's obese because it might hurt his feelings. And maybe there's reasons why he's overweight and obese. Well, there quite clearly are reasons. And unless we actually own up to the fact that that kid needs support and we provide that support, then the problem can be resolved. But to shy away from the real specifics of you're overweight or you're obese and we're going to help you deal with this and here's the reasons why, if we keep shying away from that in case we hurt somebody's feelings... That number of 22% is only going to increase. Um, and I think it's it's ludicrous that we've gone so far down the road of political correctness that you can't tell anybody anything anymore without fear of litigation or upsetting somebody's feeling or becoming that guy that has an opinion. And I hate to tell everybody, but we still have freedom of speech. Absolutely. You know, and my freedom of speech is not to be nasty and to belittle and to be derogatory towards people, but to help them identify areas they can improve on for a better quality of life. 
if we all engage in that way, then actually it's not so much of an issue and we can move on from where we are at the moment. If you look at the the health outcomes of someone who's obese, it's all and look, I've 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 had moments of being um towards that obese side as well. So that this isn't preaching to the <laughs> um to the choir here. Um but in terms of outcomes, especially for children, um you're looking at type two diabetes, you're looking at kidney diseases, you're looking at increased um um risk of 13 different types of of cancers cardiovascular disease alzheimer's dementia um and a substantial increase in the risk of mental health all from this one cause which is obesity yeah and it's you're right i mean there are all those kind of uh, direct links and st strict correlations between those um predicaments that obese obesity can then bring to that individual's life and circumstance but again, it's the funding issue that kind of makes that the craziest. You've got type 2 diabetes, which costs in the region of something like 250, 300 million pounds in children's type 2 diabetes by the NHS per year. Oh. And yet the cure for it is go for a 10 minute walk every day. So when you've had your dinner with your family, go for a 10 minute walk, you know, every day, seven days a week is 70 minutes of activity, 70. Then you've got your two hours of physical education in school. If it's active enough, all of a sudden that becomes a lot more of a number and it's getting closer to that 60 minutes every day that is the recommendation of physical activity for children aged 5 to 18. So there are simple solutions that can be made that are cost effective and don't really take a great deal of burden. For example, let's say I've got three kids, which well I do have, mm -hmm. uh, and they're all obese. And I'm not obese as a dad and the mum's not obese either. And we recognise that actually our kids are obese. What can we do to make that better step by step? Well, we can look at things like their diet. How much are the kind of high fatty, high saturated fats or high sugar products do we do? And can we limit some of them? Not take them away altogether, but to limit them. What can we do when we go to the shops? Well, let's not park right at the front door. Let's take the furthest parking space away and make the kids walk into the shop and carry the shopping back to the car. That's physical activity, that's muscle strength and it's bone strength and it's all the activity they need to actually resolve the situation. Let's go for a family walk every weekend. Let's go for join and park run events when we're ready for it. Let's not do screen time for more than an hour every single day. There are habits we can put in place that cost nothing really, but can change everything in terms of that child's outlook and that child's health issues. But I think that for parents, they don't see the relationship when their kid's five and obese to that kid at 25 having heart failure, for example. They don't realize that more people die in the world of physical inactivity than smoking-related diseases. I mean, incredible that start, isn't it? It's absolutely incredible. Just, that's crazy on so many levels. You think about all the taxation we've put on cigarettes. We've banned it in pubs and stuff like this many years ago, as we know. Vaping's become the new thing that they're trying to rectify and get rid of that stuff as well now. And society's done a good job of trying to shift that smoking habit, and it has done that to a certain extent for sure. But we've done nothing to really address the physical inactivity pandemic. And it is a pandemic that nobody's really paying attention to. So you mentioned in passing there is guidelines. So again, as a, as a dad of three, I'm totally unaware that there's, there's, there's any sort of guidelines of information. So at a high level, what are these guidelines that our kids should be getting? So the 24-hour movement behaviours, uh, the guidelines, they really look at kind of three component parts. Level of physical activity, uh, the amount of sleep a child gets, and something called sedentary screen time. Or better to think about just sitting still, not being active, if you like, or not standing up. So if you take, for example, the World Health Organization's guidelines, you've got a recommendation of 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity um, for kids 5 to 18, as I said earlier. But off, those, off that week, three of those days should be spent in vigorous physical activity. Now, the difference between moderate and vigorous, moderate is where you're on a, a jog and you're out of breath, but you can talk. So you might be able to say a sentence, a couple of breaths, and then mm. say a sentence again. Yeah. That'd be like moderate physical activity. Vigorous is when you're not talking <laughs> to anybody. You know, you're full on pelt. So we know that kids aren't really doing as much as that as they used to, you know, and there's different reasons for that. But the guidelines are certainly 60 minutes of MVPA, moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. They want to make sure that uh, kids of certain ages have a certain amount of hours of sleep. So, for example, for a zero to, to four year old, you're really looking at 10 to 13 hours a day. And then it kind of whittles down to about an average of eight hours per day of quality 
sleep. Until they're a teenager, then it's 15 <laughs> hours again. <laughs> then it's back yeah. to 15 hours yeah. and they're teenager, exactly. Uh, that's because their brains are building sites, teenagers, to be fair to them. Should you let them sleep? Uh, in my Sorry. opinion, um, I think you shouldn't just let them sleep. I think you have to look at the whole entire lifestyle that they're having. And I think that's where people make the mistakes often, is that they just look at one component part. But life isn't just sleep, it isn't just activity, it isn't just screen time, it's the whole package yeah. you've got to look at. So... The question would be if they're really physically active and they're not spending a lot of time in screen time, then my advice would be let them sleep. If they're healthy, if they are looking like they're energized and they've got enough to get through their day and they're performing on a daily basis regularly, let them sleep. If it's they're lethargic and they're under the weather and they get bugs a lot and so on, then you might want to look at all of the three behaviors and see which ones are not quite marrying up with the, the recommendations that are there. But these 24-hour movement guidelines, uh, movement behaviour guidelines, they've been around for quite some time now. The difficulty for me is I don't think a great deal of people in the public domain actually know that they exist. Now, there's lots of organisations out there trying to promote it. Universities, for sure, a lot of physical activity research being done, particularly physical activity uh, health uh, at University of Strathclyde. Uh, the Physical Activity, Health and Research Centre at University of Edinburgh, probably your leading two in Scotland in terms of physical activity health promotion. Um, but again, they're relying on public health sector partners and government to also get that information out there and to support families to, to know how to do it. I suppose it's good to give a shout out to a site called Actify, which is a freely accessible government funded charitable uh, website which has tons of pages to encourage people of all ages, sizes, creeds, colours and otherwise how to be active and what are, what's out there in your area to, to help you increase your activity. So the information's there, it's just people aren't accessing it. That sounds like a fantastic place to start for awareness overall as a nation, doesn't it? If we, if we look at what the government spends on advertising other campaigns, um, I think if a, a fraction of that money went into regular messaging, regular tips about movement um and these guidelines i was completely unaware of them um one of the things that i dread to ask you this question i absolutely <laughs> dread to ask you this question um screen time for kids <coughs> and I, I i hang my head with guilty shame because i think i know what's coming well i think we've got to be clear about what the actual issue is screens are people say oh but you know kids are gaming all the time uh, they're on their xbox they're on their playstation they're on their ipad and we blame technology for this. Technology is not their fault. Screen time use, technology use, digital touchscreen devices can be fantastically beneficial for kids' learning and development, hugely so. What it needs is another human being to be interacting with them when they're on it. So there's two strands for me. One is that it can become a babysitting service. Like it's dead easy to stick an iPad in front of a kid. But let's look at the reality of housework needs to be done, cooking needs to be done, and stuff like it's this. Easy, so it's, it's easy to do. Of it's course better. it is. And also, it's 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 what's the difference between giving them a screen or giving them a book or a set of cranes and a piece of paper? Or So you're still making them sedentary. They're still being inactive. But sometimes in life, they have to be whilst you're getting on to do the other stuff of what a family life and, and home learning environment is like. The difficulty for me is that there's a lot more extra gaming that's that's now available you know when the nintendo wii came around and people could be active it started off with people running about their living room and then they realized that they could sit on the sofa and just flick a wrist and have the same effect so i think the general idea of screen time is for me i think you want to limit it as much as you can where the kids are using it on their own and in a dormant position so sitting or lying i think using it where you're interacting with them to do things like look up stuff and, and try to get their knowledge increased or whatever, I think that's a great thing that parents should be doing is actually playing with their kids to interact with their kids, even for that human contact. But I think there's times where we need to then take what we're learning on those screens and then put it into a kind of real life situation. Um, and there's some great examples over professionals and colleagues I've met over the years. There's one, a childminder who's was involved in a piece of research that I'm doing at the moment. Uh, and they do things like she's got a forest school nursery. So they search up different animals on the iPad for the kids. And then they leave the iPad. They go armed with pictures of it that the kids have drawn or that have been you know, printed out or whatever. And they go looking in the forest for these bugs or these animals and stuff. So that's a really nice way to show how you can actually use digital devices in a very productive way and have the kids learning and having them active at the same time. 
Now you take that into a family home, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's about habitual change. And families just get so used to getting stuck in that rut of, well, this is what we've always done, so that's what we'll always do. Well, that's fine, but that means that you're always going to get what you've already got. It's about making change. It's recognising that if you have a family with three kids, for example, it's dead easy in Scotland to say, ah, the weather's not great. But the weather's never going to be great. So we can't just blame the weather for not being active. So if I was being personal with you, I'd say to you, every dinner time, sit around a table together with no screens on the table, eat your dinner, then go for a walk, a 10 minute walk together and make it happen. Your kids will hate you to begin with. Well, they absolutely will. And then eventually <laughs> they'll realise that that's the norm and it becomes a norm and so they'll they'll do it. But it is about having to go through that fight with them in the first instance to make that change. But it's also having that fight within yourself to make that change too. And I think the more that you do that, you'll realise that the best 10 minutes of your entire day is that walk with your kids because then they talk, you know, and, and that's such an important part of family life is communication. No, absolutely. Um, one of the issues with screen times as well, a lot of, especially social media, it's designed to hijack your attention. It gives you dopamine hits. Um, and these kids from a, a young age are sitting scrolling. Um, so as a parent trying to compete with that, um, if that's what they've been, been left alone with it, it, it does challenge you at, as a parent. You need to do something is, is the basic outcome of that. Um, and sometimes when you come home from work, you don't want to do it. But as you say, it's all, all about choices, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely about choices. It's always about choices. I mean, the dopamine hit's important because we need dopamine mm -hmm. for our attention. I think the difficulty is because of the visual stimulation, it's a very quick hit of dopamine. It's not really a long lasting flow, if you like. So things like being active gives you a much longer lasting flow of those really good happy hormones, you know, serotonin, endorphins, dopamine, so on. The ones that just make us feel good. Uh, and you want them to be kind of secreted over a longer period of time to really get the best benefit from it. Something called brain derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And actually that stuff enhances your executive function skills, which I spoke about earlier. So it is about making choices as a family to change lifestyle habits. And if there's any families listening, I'd recommend just choose one habit and work on that one first and then add the other. So choose your battles carefully. Um, interact with your kids when they're using their screens and their Game Boys and whatever else. Um, Game Boys, you're Game showing Boys. your age yeah. I, I'm definitely <laughs> showing my age there. But um, I definitely think that interacting with them allows you then not only to be in their world that they like, but gives you more of a chance of encouraging them to come and do something different instead. I mean, I had my, my middle and my youngest daughter stay with me this weekend, for example, and we played Scrabble. Old fashioned, get the tiles out and play Scrabble. Um, and it's it's simple things. And, and I guess I'm lucky because my girls have only ever known me being active, their mum being active. And so again, that environment shaped them to want to be active too. So they do gymnastics and taekwondo and CrossFit and cheerleading and football and all these wonderful things because they want to, not because we've had to force them to. And I think that's the difference. If they see you behaving that way, there's more chance they'll want to follow suit. Yeah, the responsibility always lies with the parents. 100%. Always, not schools, not other governments, not, it's it's your responsibility. Yeah, I mean, the governments and the schools can encourage parents to get them better educated and to support their decisions. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the parent making the right decision at the right time for the right reason. And what's your thoughts? So I've, I've got a, a teenager, he loves to sit on his Xbox, but also that's how they socialise now. So when we were younger, you would go around to someone's house or you would walk the streets or you would do something. But they'll meet up online, virtually, and that's how they, that's how they socialise. Um, I guess that's better than sitting looking at an iPad on your own, that you're, you're interacting with someone. I have kind of two opinions on this. I think it is good that they have that social connectivity. I'm not sure I would call it interacting, though. Mm -hmm. I think to really interact on a human level, you need to be in that human space with somebody. Like we're having this nice interview across a table, which is great, as opposed to through a screen, for example. And so everything like the little nuances of our body language and so on, we're picking up on because we see what each other's doing. We're sitting with very open postures and so on. Uh, we're fully clothed from, from foot to toe <laughs> and, and back up to head again, whereas the Zoom days and the, the, these things, that it's just waste up. So it's very hard to read somebody's full body language and therefore hard to interact with them in that capacity. So I think it's great that these things are available for example, for people to connect with family, friends uh, who are long distance away. Great technological advance for that. 
But I think in terms of the kids social interacting with each other, again, it's a combination that's required. Yes, the, the, the Xboxes and so on, because that's the medium that they operate now. But also to still arrange play dates and get togethers and stuff like this, because it's that human touch, it's that human connectivity that we mustn't ever lose sight of in terms of the value of that and the importance of it. Um, that sense of belonging, that sense of wanting to be part of something is, is a very basic human need. So we should never rule that out and not, never ever forget about it. I guess the overall message that's coming through is it's about a whole child approach, isn't it? It's about every aspect of their life. And you're not saying don't, don't eat sugary sweets, don't use your iPad, don't do this, don't sit and try and be the perfect person. I guess it's about balance. Yeah, it's definitely a balance. I think this is where, again, some guidelines that are available can be quite scary and very difficult and very hard for parents to achieve. When you start putting numbers on things like, you know, 60 minutes of moderate, vigorous physical activity every day, that's an hour. And a parent sits and says, I don't have an hour every day to make my kid physically active. So I do think, like you suggested, we need to make it much more about the whole of the child and every aspect that that brings. Um, and knowing that each aspect interacts with another. So I definitely think that the guidelines in terms of the language that's used could be changed and should be changed to put a better message that's more realistic out there for parents to feel good parents. Whereas at the moment, I think the way the guidelines are, are written, it makes more parents feel bad that they're not achieving it, if you like. It doesn't Absolutely. really have the impact that you want it to have. So I think we need to have the same message just delivered in a slightly different way. But to look at the whole child, I think, is essential for parents for sure absolutely um so to finish up i'm going to try and get for for anyone watching i'm going to try and extract a free bit of consultancy from you <laughs> <laughs> so um for the new parent for the the and i've got loads of uh, guys in my work just now who are having babies for the first time so i'll point them towards that because i'm not getting any sleep but i've got lots of time um what what one or two bits of advice would you give to the, the brand new first time parent with the baby I think the first thing I would suggest is typically new parents want to read up on all the expert guidance that's out there. Um, there's things like the Gina Ford series books, which have been around for decades and so on. There's a lot of information out there, almost too much. I think what you want to do is read a bit of this, get yourself armed with some knowledge and then decide what best fits for your lifestyle, especially with new babies. So people will recommend things like they should be napping this, this time of day eating then and so on. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, they should be doing certain things, but it has to fit into the environment that child is in. So look at your home environment, look at your work patterns and think how to get the best of my kid, given those limitations and restrictions that I have as a parent, rather than try to do the expert advice all the time. Yeah, which, super parent. Yeah, yeah. exactly that. Um, I think time, spend time with your kids. It's the most precious commodity we have. It's the quickest one to go away. Um, you blink and your kid's a teenager. You blink and they're an adult and it, it just surpasses you so quickly um, and you can't get it back. So things like, do I want to spend the extra hours of overtime at work or do I actually want to desperately get home and be with my kids? My advice is go home and be with your kids because the money's going to be there regardless. It just means your lifestyle will change a little bit, but the time you can't get back. A career yeah. you can progress whenever you choose, but you can't get your time back with your kids. No, that's uh, very true. Then what about, um, is the answer going to be the same for whatever age your kids are? If it's from three, three to seven, seven to ten, no, I don't 10 think to 15? So. I mean, I think that time is, is definitely going to be a common answer to the question regardless of age your kids are at. I think as your kid reaches that age of, let's say from a formal starting a school from five years and above, I think communication's king. I think you have to not just talk to your kid, but listen to your kids and have the understanding that communication is a two-way process or, or more if there's more people involved in the conversation. I get a lot of parents that come into the clinic and they say that, you know, they love driving their kid to school because there's no distractions and their kid actually talks to them. And I kind of think that's really great, but it's also really sad. Like, why is your child only talking to you when you're in a car? Why don't they talk to you when you're at home or whatever? Um, I'm a father of three daughters, very proud of the three of them for very different reasons. But as a father, there's things I haven't done as well as I could have, despite all my knowledge. But one of the things I'm proudest of is they'll come and talk to me about 
anything. So if they're having problems with boyfriends or problems with school exams or uni or friends at school give them a hard time or whatever, they talk to me and they talk to them about these things. And and that's that's important. So I think communication would be something I'd say to parents, you need to talk to your kid, but you need to listen to your kid. And it's silly things, Danny, like how many parents shout through a wall at their kid to come down for their dinner? Well, I do maybe, <laughs> so maybe actually, if you think about it from a respect perspective, if you go up into the room and say, hey, little guy, that's dinner on the table, you know, pause your game or put your book down and come on, we'll have dinner together. Your mum's made a cracky meal tonight. The difference in walking up the stairs to do that versus shouting up the stairs is huge. It's, it's just huge. And I kind of think that there's not enough families even look at those very basic things of just being in the same room as our kids, having that communication, I think is is really important. It builds a bond. It does. And from a, a more clinical side in terms of the, the, the movement aspect, is there any particular, if you could only do one or two things with a young child, what, what would they be to give them the best? I think regardless of age, balance stimulation a variety of different ways to move their body, both big and fine muscle control. So as easy as standing on one foot, hopping, skipping. All of that stuff. Yeah. The more ways that child learns to move their body, the more opportunities they have to, to learn easier. If you're limited in how you move, you're limited in how well you can learn. So I would say that lots of balance stimulation, uh, lots of movement opportunities of a variety of different kinds, and lots of music in there, lots of rhythm and beat and timing and, and pitch and melody and cadence. These three things are, are the root of being completely human to the best of your ability. And they give you access to so much more than just being able to move. So that would be my advice going forward. Excellent. And and one last question for you, because I, I, I was listening to the radio when this came up, and I thought I'm going to ask Andy about this. <laughs> um, it was about um, in early education. I'm not even sure if it's in Scotland. It might have been in the UK, but early education about they're only allowed to use inclusive language and they're only allowed to use positive tones. So we, Johnny, setting someone in fire, you've got to say, oh, now that's that maybe not the best outcome. You've got to be very positive. Do you think that can have a detrimental effect if a child goes up until seven or eight and they've never had a negative phrase said towards them? From a neurological perspective, surely that has to have an impact. I think, you know, logically it will have. I think um, emotionally more directly so. I think that kids need to learn when they're wrong, to know what it means to be right. If they're never really told, no, that's wrong, how do you understand what right is? There's no opposite to go with. There's no evaluation there for that child. I think, as I said earlier, we're, we're becoming overly protective of everybody's feelings that we're, we can't tell honest truths anymore. And the whole point of honesty is it creates respect and, and trust. And that's what kids need in their life first more than anything else is trust. And um, my mum and dad are going to love me for the rest of my life. Are they going to provide for me until I can provide for myself? That's trust. That That's what that is. And some of that is the honesty of, of saying to your kids, I love you right now, don't like you because <laughs> you've, you've been an idiot or you're not behaving yourself or you're not making smart choices. But I, I do love you. I just don't like you at the moment. And that's okay if you can then do the next bit of, however, if you make this decision and here are the options things will be better for you. So letting them get to the point where they can manage themselves. But you've got to be honest and truthful with them to help them get there. I think we're too flowery and too soft yeah. at this moment in time. It can't all be good in it life. Can't it can't be. Good. No, it can't all be good. No, it can't all be sugar. It can't all be sugar. As you say, it's about balance. So if anyone wants to find out um, more about what you do, Andy, what's the best way to, to do that? I mean, the best way is a variety of social media platforms. So on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, I also have a website called bettermoversandthinkers.com. And all my contact details and phone number and things is, is on that as well. Excellent. I think we could have done this for a couple of hours, Andy. So <laughs> I'm sure we'll get you back on at some point. So real pleasure and thanks for coming on. Listen, thanks for the time and I'll, I'll come back anytime. <laughs> <laughs>